All right, Guy, mission accomplished. First and foremost at every World Cup, you got to get out of the group stage. So box ticked for Gareth Southgate in England. Yeah, Marty, I, I, I'd go along with that. Uh, there was, I mean, as everyone's aware, there's a, there's a lot of uh, interest around England at major tournaments, not least here in, the, here in England as well. And uh, there was quite a backlash to that performance uh, against the United States. Uh, but yeah, as you're saying, it's job done. Uh, if you look at the problems that some other big teams have been having uh, in terms of bringing their best form throughout the group stages. You know, we think of Germany, Argentina, uh, you know, have lost matches in the group stages. It's not easy. Uh, there, there, there are a lot of good teams uh, in the group stages, in those groups as well. Uh, we've got to think about where this tournament is placed in the season, in the context of most of the top European, most of the top players play in Europe. Uh, and it's come, of course, after that heavy start to the season that we've discussed before. So, uh, yeah, yeah, it's 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 job done for England. It's something to build on. Uh, I'm personally, from my point of view, people are talking about again. This is so exciting and everything. The players, uh, how they played against Wales. I don't think for England the problem is going forward. Frankly, uh, I think it's in defence. Uh, they weren't really troubled too much uh, by Wales tonight overall but that's going to be the big question mark uh, ahead of the bigger tests which are going to come for them uh you know even looking around the 16 against senegal senegal are a quality team and then looking ahead of course once you get to the quarters uh, that england will hope to do possibilities of france there Kylian mbappe uh it's going to be difficult for england but as you suggest first things first get through the group they're group winners uh, and they can look to build from there See, so, I mean, can I argue argue with you on 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 this? I think England England England's problem is looking from this distance is that they're just too <laughs> slow and ponderous moving the ball up the field. You've got incredible mm. pace. I mean, when you look at that squad and those players, the fact that he brought Foden in and he dropped Mount, I mean, that was just increasing pressure from everyone. It seemed commenting media fans, everybody. I don't know whether that influenced him, mm. but it was fascinating mm. that he did that. You got Harry Kane, who looks as though he's playing on half an ankle, and I don't know why he stayed on the whole of the match. That was confusing to me, but. When you've got a squad of players like that, do you think there's a coach like Pep or, or Klopp or somebody like that that could get more out of those those players in this team? Yeah, it's a fascinating point. I mean, as always, you don't mince your words. No, sorry, <laughs> no, I, I mean, mean you know. yeah, I, no, it's 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 your raison d'etre, isn't it? I mean, it's uh, it's uh, no. I mean, the thing is, with with Kane, obviously, my Spurs connections, myself, uh, I said this in the match against the US. I said it before. He's not fit uh, at the moment. Uh, he's managing himself. I think there's enormous pressure. If you look at Gareth Southgate and the England team, how that team's been built over the last few years with Kane as the figurehead. Look, he's only a few goals short of Wayne Rooney's record of England goals here. But amazingly, Marty, nine goals scored by England in this tournament so far. And he hasn't got one of them. All right. I mean, he's got assists in there, but he's the centerpiece, the figurehead, the captain of the team. Uh, as I said, the spearhead of it, and he's not 100% fit. So I think I think part of the problem is with Southgate, is with all managers, and you mentioned Pep Guardiola, Jurgen Klopp in this as well, all managers we know over the years watch this game and everything. As you go on, they uh, have a loyalty to certain players. Um, and we see this with England. It hasn't reared its head yet with Harry Maguire uh, at the back. Uh, I suggest there are going to be bigger issues to come. Uh, I'm not, from an English point of view, looking forward to seeing Harry Maguire, for instance, against the likes of a Kylian Mbappe or a top quality uh, European forward. Uh, I think that's a problem for England. Um, but as you suggest, I think he's brought Foden in tonight. Marcus Rashford was excellent mm, mm. Uh, coming in. It's really pleasing to see uh, Marcus Rashford after a difficult period, if you think for Manchester United as well in general. Marcus Rashford is Man United. You know, from the youth system, he's a Man Cunin, he's there. He's come back here uh, for England. He's building form. That's encouraging for Southgate. You can't really realistically see uh, Rashford being dropped now for the next next match for England after what he's done in the in the you know his, in his couple of appearances. They've got that debate there between him and Raheem Sterling. For me, it's not a debate. Uh, right now, Rashford has to start over Sterling, but that's going to be an interesting one because Southgate, again, the question of managerial loyalty to players who've been in and around the system. Uh, 
Harry Kane's there, obviously, as the captain. Harry Maguire is there. But Raheem Sterling's another one who's delivered over the years. So Southgate feels a kind of a sense of loyalty uh, to him overall to bring, bring him into the team. But Rashford, for me, has got to play now. Uh, and Foden as well. I mean, look at Phil Foden for Manchester City. I mean, this made in Manchester yeah, yeah. Uh, effort tonight against Wales with the, with, the, with the two of them getting the three goals. Uh, you know, to get get the better of Wales as well. These are exciting talents. If England are going to go deep, go further, you feel these younger players who are building some form have got something about them. Southgate's got to pick them. You know, and and I and I, and I look back to 2018 because you got to look at the past to actually you know predict the future. And I look back to also uh, the European Championships, and and this is an England side that rather than gaining confidence through the tournament, seems to play more conservatively in the latter stages of the tournament, and and you know sits really deep. And and that's that's us, you know, from again from distance is the kind of the worry. You know, does he let these players the the the, the buzz term mm. these days is express themselves? Is he is he is he prepared to go all out for a win rather than not concede a goal? And you know, I just wonder whether that's his mentality, his headspace. Plus, the other part of it, as yeah. a Spurs fan, do you yeah. do you look at it and go, "Look, I want Harry Kane back on the pitch for my team. I don't want him playing on a busted ankle for, for England." How do you how do you how do you how do you reconcile that as an Englishman? Yeah, well, I, I've had this kind of chats. Uh, you know, your good friend uh, Mark Watson before yes. about this, and with many people as well. I mean, I, yeah, I mean. I, I support England in the major tournaments. I've got a problem with Harry Kane playing all these minutes. I'll be up front about there. Um, Antonio Conte wasn't able to rest him. He played virtually every minute for Tottenham Hotspur in that crammed, crazy spell uh, to start the season. He's then literally come into this tournament. I don't think he's been 100% fit from the start. I'm naturally... Uh, concerned. I mean, as a season ticket holder at Tottenham Hotspur, I effectively, you know, all the season ticket holders pay the wages of the yeah. players. We want the team to be successful. And so seeing him there, not 100% fit, being in what we call the critical zone, uh, you know, which, which he's in, definitely he's riding a tightrope there. Prospect of a bad injury uh, coming there as well. Yeah, and I, I think also, Marty, you allude to it as well. With England going forward, if England are going to do something in this tournament, it's to do with their forward, their attacking players. It's not to do with it defensively. England are not going to win this tournament, back on your point, being defensive, being difficult to beat, because frankly, they're not good enough at the back to do that. They are going to do damage in this tournament, even to the bigger teams, if they can go on the front foot, as you say, effectively take the handbrake, drop the handbrake and play attacking football. Is Gareth Southgate the manager? Uh, to really, really believe in that and to select teams that are going to go and do that. I don't know. The track record with him doesn't suggest that. Look, I mean, the thing is with England, you look at the last two major tournaments where they're at semi-final in 2018, final of Euros. So in, in one respect there, you can say Southgate delivers results in tournament football, which England had struggled to deliver for many years prior to that. But you look at, I would suggest on the other hand, you look at the what he's got at his disposal right now. And what he's got at his disposal, his main key strengths are in attacking areas. We mentioned Marcus Rashford, Phil Foden, Dr- Jack Grealish add to that. Jude Bellingham in a more withdrawn role. Jude Bellingham just looks incredible, generational talent. You want to harness him, maybe get him playing even a little bit further forward. Yes, you've got to have a defensive base, but I think England's best chances of success, as you're alluding to, are... Play these younger players, attacking players who can actually hurt opposition rather than this kind of, as you were saying, cagey, conservative style of football, Mm. which, as I say again, England can't do it, in my opinion. I think they will come unstuck because defensively they just can't aren't quite good enough to do that. Guy McRae, sports broadcaster out of the UK with us. There's always so much attention. There's so many narratives, so many storylines about England. It's fantastic. <laughs> I mean, look, the World Cup exists on England and the fact that you know that, that there's so many fans around the world that are so interested because of the Premier League. Let's actually look at that other game. United States did the business against Iran. I thought they might be really nervy and cagey themselves, but they came out, they bossed that game. They got a great 1-0 result. And again, this is the United States team through to the last 16. Let's not underestimate them. Mm, mm. Yeah, I mean, I, well, we, we referenced the, the match they play with England uh, in the group stage. They should have won that match. Um, I think a lot of this US team uh, overall, I mean, Christian Pulisic obviously got the winner there. I think a lot of Weston McKenney uh, as a talent. I thought he was excellent against England. I'd like McKenney at Tottenham Hotspur. Uh, I, I've said that for the past couple of years. Uh, Spurs have been linked with him uh, personally. I think that, you know, they've got Timothy Weyer as well. You think of George Weyer as well, George Weyer's son there as well. They've got a lot of good players and they're well coached. 
they're well drilled, but the difference I'd suggest with them in England is England have got greater attacking talents overall, but the US have got enough. But they've got an interesting style of play if you watch them with their press uh, overall, the way that they are, the way that they're coached. Um, I think they can do some decent damage. I mean, they've got a very, very tough one next up last 16 against the Netherlands. Uh, to be fair, I mean you've got Cody Gapko there, the uh, the teenager, already up to three goals uh, in the tournament. Looks pretty good already. Just has embraced the big stage. Uh, that's that that could be a good look. Good last sixteen, uh, last sixteen, Marty. There, you know, US against Netherlands, uh, with the US coming through there, as you say, in a pressure cooker situation. You know, against Iran, there was a lot naturally riding around that match, not just the. The qualification spot on the line but you know politically oh, yeah. uh, relations between the two countries as well i mean it was a factor there's no getting away from that but i think the us in all respects handled it uh very well the pressure cooker situation and i don't know i mean netherlands are favorites there in that last 16 with what they've got I wouldn't be surprised us make things difficult for them uh, in, in in that match with what i've seen of them so far Guy McRae is with us on the platform. We're talking about the World Cup results this morning uh, and then looking, of course, to the round of 16. That Senegalese side, no Mane up front. We wondered whether they would struggle. Look, they did what they had to do, which was beat Qatar and beat Ecuador, beat those two teams. But England have to go in as favourites again for that particular match, you would think. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 would, I would go along with that, Marty, overall. Uh, as you say, Senegal missing, missing Sadio Mane. I think they've done well here. Uh, to get out of the group. Uh, it was pretty nervy for them against Et- Ecuador. Those, I mean, it's been amazing, hasn't it, the amount of added time oh, <laughs> with these fixtures. I, I don't know what that means for broadcasters. I've, ch- I've talked to a couple of people involved in scheduling for this that I know, and it's just, it's, you don't know where you stand. You don't know. I mean, England have had a match, what is it, 14 minutes and 10 minutes on the end of halves? I mean, that's 25 minutes yeah, of additional time. You just lost there. Mm. Uh, so um, it causes all sorts of issues, and it was nervy at the end of that one as well. But hey, Senegal got it done. I think it's a good tournament uh, for them for them already. But as you suggest, England with their greater experience, uh, you've got to fancy them overall uh, to do enough there, I think, to go on and reach the quarterfinal. And as they, I think their England will have a much bigger test in the quarters. I don't, don't rule out Senegal here. Um, I, I, you know, I, I think they did nicely against that quarter to see it out, but I'm not sure they have enough overall, especially without Mane. Uh, to really trouble England over 90 minutes there uh, in that one. Qatar become the first side ever to host a World Cup and lose all three matches. So they're going to be remembered more for everything else about this tournament rather than their play. I mean, how how you know how how can we how can we assess how good the, the Dutch are given the fact um, yeah, that they 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 looked a bit ponderous themselves at times. But again, that's what I started the interview by saying. Look, you know, no one's going to remember the group stage, do they? Once we get into the knockouts. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I go along with that completely. And I mean, it applies to them. I mean, you've got to think where the Netherlands have come from uh, overall. I mean, they didn't even qualify for the World Cup uh, four years ago. So uh, to go through, as they have done, group winners, uh, that gives them a boost. It obviously gives them the US, which suggested already is uh, could be a little bit of a tricky one. But yeah, they've got they've got Gapko there up front. They've got Virgil van Dijk, who looks, you know, Virgil, Virgil van Dijk for Liverpool, has been up and down prior to that, but he seems to be getting himself together. Their captain, of course, the spine running through the team as well. De Jong in there as well. I mean, they've got quality, uh, the Netherlands. They always have done. And they've got, as you suggest, Marty, they've got a base now. They've got through the group, avoided that shock. Uh, If you look at it overall, seven points from the three fixtures, just like England as well at the same time. And now they can go into it and really look to take it up a gear. And they've got some quality. Uh, Louis van Gaal's got... Uh, you know, ability through that team, the players that I mentioned, uh, you know, already there uh, and big game players as well. You think about it, players who play Champions League finals, you know, play the biggest matches in European competition uh, because let's not get away from it. Look at the Brazilian team. I was, I was mentioned chatting to a couple of guys about this the other night, the Brazilian team, how many players play in Europe, play in the English Premier League. And that's, if you're looking, you're going to go, Marty, you're going to go crystal ball to the end of the tournament. You'd suggest it's going to be European-based players. European nations are going to at the end of the tournament because that's where the best footballers are and the best teams. It's where the money is uh, overall. So the Netherlands are another uh, team there that have got very, very experienced players mixed in with the likes of Gapco there. Um, 
uh, who is just lighting it up. And I think, provided they go further, we'll continue to score more goals in this tournament. Guy McRae out of the UK for us. Well, thank you so much for your time. A couple of quick questions before we let you go. I'm looking at Group C and Group D tomorrow. Um, fascinating. This Australia only need a draw against Denmark. Let's look at that. I mean, France are playing Tunisia. They're already through. Australia are more than capable of setting up and getting a little draw out of this, as they've done in their qualifying. How do you see that one ending? Yeah, I, I'd go along with you. I think they've got a good shot uh, overall. I mean, against Denmark, I don't, I'm not sure there are going to be too many goals in that fixture. Uh, overall, Danes struggle to um, score lots of goals. I mean, they've obviously they've got Christian Eriksen in there. Fantastic, as always, to see him back playing. Uh, overall, let's never, ever forget that, especially in terms of a major tournament. I know he's been back for Man United and Brentford before that, but it's great to have him there. There's going to be a big, char- you know, big pressure on that. I mean, Eriksen is their playmaker. He's the one, you know, you look overall with Australia, you're saying, okay, they're going to set up and try and get that result they need. He's the one they've got to stop. He's the one who pulls the strings. Uh, I think he's, what is it? He's created something like seven or eight chances in the couple of games so far uh, for Denmark. They do struggle a little bit for goals though, uh, Denmark, and their record in the World Cup, I think, hasn't been the best, you know, in the matches that they've played uh, this and uh, previous appearances in the tournament. So, yeah, I mean, the Aussies have got a good shot there. Overall, as you say, they're in the box seat in terms of, uh, you know, the group, in terms of Group D behind France, who are already there. France are looking imperious with Mbappe. But Australia right behind them, as you say, this theme running through it, Marty, we talked about throughout it is get through the group stage. Get through the group stage. Give yourself a shot in the round of 16. Get yourself there. And for Australia, that's definitely uh, a possibility. Finally, then you look at Group C, Poland on four, Argentina and Saudi three each. And that's Saudi Arabia in the side that did beat Argentina. So Saudi play Mexico, who are on one. Poland and Argentina play. I mean, it could actually be out of Argentina's hands. If they win, they go through, knock Poland out. But the Saudis, if they beat Mexico, how do you see this one? Who do you think are the two teams that emerge from this? <sighs> Oh, you've left your best question here for last, haven't you? Yeah. I mean, uh, this, 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 this group C, I mean, what a group. Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> brilliant. The, of all the shockers and the results, I mean, uh, you know, the, the, the star power of Messi and that, that goal from Enzo Fernandez that got Argentina, you know, back in the shakeup here. But as you say, it's beautiful, isn't it? Because you've got Poland just a point ahead. You've got Argentina on three, Saudi Arabia, who shocked Argentina, and then you've got Mexico there uh, on, on the point as well, who play the Saudis. Fascinating uh, group overall. Who's going to deal with the pressure? Um, you know, you'd suggest overall Argentina against Poland. Poland are tricky. You've got Lewandowski there, but Poland are another well drill team. Is it going to be that easy for Argentina to cut through them? They've clearly got the quality, the players, even Messi at this point in his career, you know, pulling the strings. Uh, the conductor of it all, uh, but that might not be straightforward for them. And as you say. Should they slip up overall? I mean, Saudi Arabia there, I've, I've got the result over them are, are right there. That's going to be fascinating. A really tough one, actually, Molly, for me to really stick my neck out there on what I think is going to happen in the group. And hey, if Argentina went out, I mean, that'd be a huge shocker. Massive story. Uh, because, you know, th- th- think about going into the tournament here with Brazil, or maybe just behind Brazil. I mean, a lot of people's second favourites uh, overall Argentina, and they may still well, go all the way there. But uh, they've got a test there. Poland are not going to be easy, um, you know, to deal with in that one. And as always, they've got to focus on their fixture, uh, first of all, in taking care of business there uh, to try and make it through to the round of 16.